Right, well, thank you very much. Um, so uh, as was introduced, I'm gonna be concentrating a little bit more on the idea of structural brain analysis uh, and uh, through the method known as voxel-based morphometry. And as an outline to this talk, so really we're going to introduce by, uh, we're gonna start off by introducing what, what is structural brain analysis? What are we trying to do in our objectives? And what exactly is uh, this thing called VBM? I'll then spend the middle part of the talk talking a little bit about pre-processing fundamentals and outline a step-by-step -step guide of, as to how you can do this, which will be uh, revisited later on with some of the um, processing demos. And I'll give some uh, common pitfalls and hints in terms of trying to maximize the chance you can find something with your data. And then in the final part, I'll talk about two uh, extensions to the VBM framework. One, looking at longitudinal, longitudinal analyses, which is something we're all quite interested in, and the other using uh, quantitative MRI and this idea of voxel-based quantification. So when we're thinking about anatomical analyses, what we're essentially trying to do is line up like-for-like -like structures uh, and then compare them across a population of, of uh, subjects or, or clinical patients. And this uh, actually taps into a range of different scales. So at the one end, we have uh, whole brain properties. So for example, in post-mortem, you just measure whole brain uh, weight and you can use that as contrasting uh, brains. But we're after something, and, and certainly there's a, a equivalent of that in MRI, where people just look at total gray matter volume or white matter volume. So I get measures that are, are used even now. But what we want to try and do is something a little bit more nuanced. So once you get beyond just looking at the whole brain, you get into this idea that we can compare regional shape properties of different brain structures or different brain regions. And there are two ways you can really look at this. One is you do the hard work of manually defining regions of interest or, or volumes, or you can try and uh, do some voxel wise uh, contrast of what's called tissue density. And this is where VBM sits into the, the framework. Um, and then the next level down, so once you've looked at the shape properties, you then may start being interested in, well, what is changing in the underlying tissue that really is driving the changes in shape? You're, you're measuring at more of a mesoscopic scale. Uh, and there you'll start extracting MR signals using things like quantitative MRI, and that then taps into the idea of voxel-based quantification. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is understand what's going on at, at a sort of histological, biological level. What are the changes in the underlying brain tissue that are driving uh, the measure that we're interested in or, or the phenomenon that we're interested in? So what is VBM and how does this fit into this? So morphometry is really the study of the size and shape of the brain and its structures. And voxel-based means we're just comparing at a voxel-wise level across a population. And this picture here really just sort of summarizes what we're doing. So you can forget for a minute the rest of the brain. And if you concentrate on what's actually happening at one individual voxel, you have a population of subjects and you're extracting some signal, which in this case is a measure of tissue uh, density or, or volume. Uh, you're extracting that across a population at a single point in the brain, and you're comparing across your two groups the, the, the surrogate size of this region. So it, it boils back down to a single univariate test at one point in the brain. Uh, um, but what lends itself to the study of anatomy is you can then repeat this process over every voxel of the brain and using the SPM framework for multiple comparison corrections, etc. And we can use this to answer lots of very interesting questions. So um, you might be uh, interested in the patterns in distinguishing between groups, so looking for patterns of disease, for example, in Alzheimer's versus healthy controls. You may want to look at uh, uh, aging development uh, uh, and look for the changes that un underlie that. You may be giving your subjects a task and want to identify areas with plasticity. So the, these are some of the examples of quite famous uh, juggling studies. Or you may have some behavioral measure that you're particularly interested in, and you want to find what areas of the brain co-vary with this particular measure that I'm interested in. Um, and here's an example of each one of these. So uh, on the left-hand side, we've got an example of just a relatively small group of Alzheimer's versus controls. And what's quite nice about this is you're recapitulating the histological hallmarks of uh, the disease. So in, in Alzheimer's, what you're expecting to see is hippocampal and anterior medial temporal lobe atrophy, which is, which is what you get. So nice sanity check. Uh, second column, this is a paper from Caligan et al in 2014, where they were looking at age-related changes in the brain. 
In terms of plasticity, so uh, Kinin et al in 2014 had a group of people before and after learning to play Super Mario Bros, showing that you get some, uh, again, some hippocampal and frontal lobe changes uh, as you get better at that. Um, and then finally on the left hand side there, you can pick any measure that you want. And in this study, they looked at political orientation. So how left wing or right wing you are. And what they found is the, the progressively more right wing you are, the larger your amygdala, uh, uh, the larger your amygdala is. So it's part of the sort of lizard brain um, with a corresponding decrease in, in your cingulate regions. And it all comes back to this. So you'll see this figure repeated many times over this course. Um, and voxel based morphometry really plugs into this framework. And we uh, take advantage of the, the normalization step, the tissue segmentation and normalization to a group average space, really to extract our measures and then plug them into this GLM. So what is tissue segmentation? So this, this is one of these ideas that lies at the heart of this. So when we acquire our MP rage or our structural MRI, it really reveals lots of fine structural detail about the brain, but not all of it's reliable and not all of it's we're particularly interested in. So for example, you may have vessels, which we don't really particularly want to analyze routinely. You get um, inhomogeneity in the MR field, uh, which can lead to bias in your data. So we want to try and take that all out and, and actually analyze differences in brain structures. Um, also worth noting that with most routinely acquired T1 weighted MRI, um, the actual values, the intensity at each voxel uh, is not quantitatively meaningful. So it will vary from scan to scan, day to day. Um, and actually, you have to acquire quite highly optimized scans before you can start getting into the game of comparing the, the values of the intensities at each voxel. So um, to get around to this, historically, the, the regional volumes of the three main tissue classes are well defined. You can do, you can extract them quite reliably, and they have some very interesting properties that we will we will make use of. So how do we do it in SPM? So if you pull up your SPM twelve uh, graphical user interface, very at the very top of the box, you've got your segment button. Uh, this is the new segment. There are there are no differences anymore in in SPM. So you simply click on that. And it brings up uh, a menu. So I've actually expanded this menu out so you can see the whole thing, but in the actual uh, software, you'll scroll down to get the different options. You have the options to put in uh, different uh, structural MRIs. So this just shows um, just putting in one channel, but SBN has the uh, uh, option to introduce more channels of data. So if you had say T1 or T2 or magnetization transfer and R1, you can introduce them all as a different channel and you save like for like. So the populations have to line up. Um, the bias correction, so this, this saves a version of your T1 weighted MRI with the bias field in homogeneities removed. This is quite a good idea if you're creating a group average, a, a population group average of your own data, because then you can create your own average T1 weighted MRI for projecting uh, results onto and it looks quite good. And then you have your different tissue classes, which we come to. Um, you'll find that when you go to it, you get different options about native versus data imported tissue. So native tissue is going to be the tissue that's lined up with your original uh, T1 weighted MRI. So it'll, it will overlay quite nicely onto that. Your data imported tissue has been rigidly aligned to what's called data import space. Basically, it's, it's lined up with uh, the sort of uh, an MNI template, but there's been no bending or stretching going on. And it basically brings all your data into really close alignment before you get into any nonlinear warping. And this is important because the closer your data is together before you start any other sort of warping steps or deformation steps, the better your results will be at the end. And this is also one you have to keep an eye on because if your original data is uh, located quite far out of the cent center of field of view in the MRI, it can cause some problems and occasionally you have to manually correct this. Um, and then you've got some other sort of options uh, at the bottom, but we won't, we won't go into those at this point, but they're worth playing with. So this just shows you the difference between a native T1 weighted MRI. So you, you get a little bit of brighter signal because people are, are lying down in the scanner, the head's often resting against the head coil. You'll end off with a brighter band closer to the back more frequently, uh, and you'll get this variation in signal, which is non-biological. Uh, and when you get it bias corrected, it simply flattens that whole thing for you. <laughs> 
And this is what the segmentations look like. So this is uh, this particular subject and in SPM, uh, the defaults, you've got your sort of three uh, main tissue classes. So C1 is always gray matter, C2 white matter, C3 CSF. And these are the ones we're most interested in from a VBM or structural analysis point of view. But you also have additional tissue property, uh, tissue maps. So you get the bone, soft tissue and air. Um, and certainly in, uh, so people who research MEG uh, are often interested in some of these more soft tissue segmentations. And this is what it looks like overlay. So it does a pretty good job. And if you, this, is this uh, basically ascends up through the brain a few slices, and you can see it's it's doing a reasonable job of capturing our gray and white matter tissue boundaries um, and the other tissue classes there. Um, when you do the SPM uh, step, you'll, you'll also have a dot map file that gets written out with this. And it allows you to also uh, calculate total intracranial volume. So total intracranial volume by definition is the summation of your gray matter, white matter and CSF. It's the total amount of space you have uh, in your cranial cavity. And it's a useful surrogate measure of overall uh, size. We know that uh, the bigger you get, the bigger the, the brain is. Um, but actually, the overall size doesn't really tell you a lot about brain function. And so we often want to uh, co-vary this out and remove the effects of um, just overall body size. Uh, and by doing this, um, that allows you to do it. Um, in the utilities options, you'll have the tissue volumes option. And so once you've run uh, SPM segment, you can select all your segate.mat files, uh, say uh, click on calculate volumes, and it will write out uh, in millimeter cubes the volume of each tissue class, um, which we'll use later on. Right, that brings us on to the VBM step. So VBM is the statistical parametric mapping of regional segmented tissue density or volumes. How you exactly interpret this, uh, you have to approach with a little bit of caution. So gray matter density isn't uh, the same as neuronal packing density. It doesn't tell you that how many uh, cell bodies are there or anything like that, but we hope that it's a surrogate measure of that. Um, and so often what you, you will end off doing is using uh, the clinical pathological literature or, or, or histological literature to try and help you create a narrative or, or understand and unpack what your results are telling you. Or if you use quantitative MRI, then you can use other um, measures of brain tissue properties to help understand why uh, the changes, uh, what, what's changing in order to drive these volumetric changes. And there'll be an example of that later on. So this gives you an overview of the, the, the main processing steps in VBM, uh, for VBM. So you acquire your data, your data sits on, on you know, the, the scanner server file. You'll have your DICOM import, you have lots of uh, nifty files. Um, you'll perform your segmentation, get them all nicely in line. You'll then perform some nonlinear warping step to bring it all into a group average space. Uh, and in SPM, the one that we, we congregate towards now is called uh, the shoot uh, in the menu. It's a geodesic shooting uh, algorithm. You'll then warp all, all your data. You'll come up with your uh, model design, analyze it, visualize it, and then hopefully write it up. So here's a step-by-step -step overview of those main uh, ones I've outlined. Of all the steps that you do, this is by far and away the most important. It will save you time, heartache, um, particularly if you don't do it, you get to the end, and you're trying to understand why your data is giving you unusual results or why things aren't working. So you should always, always visually check your data. Don't take anything for granted, even if you've acquired it or you've inherited it from someone else. Um, things that will ruin your day, so poor scan quality, artifacts, abnormal tissue, so people who've had, say, strokes, lacuna damage. As people get older, you get quite a bit of dual thickening or the dura can sag onto the brain and, and cause some slightly unusual effects. Brain lesions, you get abnormal brain, so people can have arrested hydrocephalus, have quite big ventricles. And because it's quite removed from what, where the normal tissue priors have been calculated, again, it can give some very unusual segmentations that won't work properly. And again, the, the, probably the more common one that you will see are people who have been um, misaligned in the original scanning. So, so for some reason or other, their, their, their alignment uh, is quite far out of the field of view um, and you will have to do some manual correction. And occasionally uh, in large studies, things like header issues can creep in. So again, don't, don't assume that all the data is behaving itself. Look at it and, and convince yourself that that's the case. So this is an example of um, a relatively famous open source data set, uh, which can remain nameless. 
Um, and, but what it's trying to show you, so if you focus just on the crosshairs and you look across the population, hopefully you can begin to see, first off, there's quite a lot of variation in terms of the overall signal intensity, it varies quite a lot, but also the position of the brain. So this person over here, you've got it centered on near the pontine region. Oh, in this subject over here, it's above the corpus callosum. This person's very far distorted and so forth. Uh, and if you don't take into account these there, then you'll end off with some um, misaligned segmentations and some uh, bad results. What you want to do, what you want to end off with is have them all rigidly aligned so that they are in very close proximity. So this is the result of um, using the Dartel Orient space to also rigidly align our native T1s. And hopefully you can appreciate now that actually across this population, the crosshairs are so situated more or less where posterior commissure would be. Um, and it's pretty much the same across all your population of subjects. And this is the this is the state of play you want to be in before you start undertaking any warping or, or deformation uh, or calculating group average, simply because this group average calculations is a very slow step. Uh, it takes quite a long time. Um, and, and if you don't do it first, then, then you'll end up cursing yourself. So what happens after you've visually checked your data and everything's, everything's lined up? So you'll perform unified segmentation. Uh, you'll then calculate the, do this normalization step, calculate your group average space. You'll warp your tissues to this space, space. You'll perform this step called modulation, which preserves the tissue volumes. Um, you'll perform a little bit of Gaussian smoothing, and then you'll get into the st uh, statistics. And this really shows, it goes through those steps in pictures. So here's our structural image. We, uh, the tissue probability map in SPM gets uh, warped onto that to create our native tissue C1 image. Um, this uh, then is used to calculate our group average space. We warp it. So now we have a warped C1 image uh, where it's all lined up. We'll modulate it uh, so that uh, that's essentially preserving the tissue volumes and then it's smoothed. And then it goes into just a general linear model, which was covered earlier. So there are some subtleties to VBM. Uh, the first one we'll talk about for a bit is this idea of modulation. Uh, so what's going on there, then how much should you be smoothing your data, how to interpret your results, adjusting for the uh, intracranial volume, and this idea of a priori regions of interests. So modulation, when, uh, when we warp our tissue, what we're doing is we're bending or stretching it to line up at a group average uh, level, uh, voxels across uh, homolog uh, homologous structures. When we do this, bending or stretching, if we don't uh, take into account how much bending or stretching, essentially um, you won't understand how much the volume has has changed. So you'll you'll detect sort of mesoscopic effects, but you won't get any of this sort of interesting uh, changes in volume, which is actually what you're after. The modulation really just uh, multiplies your tissue uh, segmentations by uh, a map called your Jacobian determinant map. That's partly what's going on behind the scenes. And this will then scale the values at each voxel by how much it's either been contracted, uh, i.e. darker in the image, or stretched out, so it'll appear lighter, the values will be higher. And this is uh, an example of the Jacobian determinant image from a subject. So in this subject, compared to the group average template, they had slightly big, bigger ventricles, and the darker areas would have been smaller. And these are essentially what you're contrasting. Always say I have to... Uh, uh, I always have to change these. Um, essentially, what this tries to show is the effect of modulation. And unfortunately, it doesn't project very well on, on this. So you have to take my word for that. OK, so when we come to so once we have our warped modulated tissue maps, we then have to smooth our data a bit. Um, the reasons for this. So even with the best warping algorithms in the world available at the moment, you will never get perfect alignment of cor particularly cortical structures because um, the, the cortical folding is complex. You get variation in gyral folds. And so there is some there are some imperfection there since you, you will have to smooth it to detect some of these differences. Also, importantly, by performing the smoothing, it allows your data to become more Gaussian and closer to um, which uh, uh, aligns with the assumptions of using your random field theory. And usually your smoothing kernels will be around about six millimeters. If you smooth too much, you're going to end off with very uh, large um, blobs, but it will be meaningless. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. 
the slight exception to the smoothing rule is if there are very particular structures that you're interested in and by those what I mean are the very small subcortical nuclei that are situated quite close together so a good example is the subthalamic nucleus and the substantia nigra where if you start smoothing anything more than three or four millimeters then actually you you mix up the signals between these different structures so much that you, you can't really detect the change but these are special cases and by and large for most analyses just applying a single smoothing kernel will be enough. So here's, here's an example of what I, I mean. So on the left side, we've smoothed by five millimeters. On the right, we've smoothed by 16 millimeters. This is exactly the same contrast and analysis. And you see in, with the five millimeters, you've got a lot more spatial sensitivity uh, to be able to localize where you're detecting changes versus 16 millimeters. It looks terribly dramatic, um, but is fundamentally meaningless. So you've got some uh, change in volume somewhere that affects most of the brain and so you want you want somewhere between these extremes and I tend with most of my analyses to sort of situate myself down towards the sort of six millimeter five millimeter range uh, depending on the resolution of the data I'm dealing with. When, uh, when you're thinking about uh, anatomical analyses, many of you will probably have heard of things like free surfer and, and the sort of parcellation based approaches. So you generate lots of regions of interest and you get an average uh, volume for each region. Smoothing is a way of, of, is linked to these approaches. So what you're essentially doing is creating a locally weighted region of interest. The uh, advantage is you're not making any assumptions about site architectural boundaries, which are invariably wrong with sort of manual segmentation based approaches, um, but it can make the sort of interpretation slightly more challenging. However, uh, you know, there, there's lots of very good ways to identify where in the brain your, your regions are, uh, so I don't think it should put you off. And so how do you interpret the findings? So there are lots of ways that you can, you can uh, drive the changes you see in VBM. What we're hoping to see is, is either regional thinning or thickening of, of tissue for various reason, re, uh, reasons. But it's also worth bearing in mind that changes in cortical folding can also cause change in VBM if the data has been misregistered. Uh, again, it will, it will translate into volumetric differences. If you have some unusual tissue property or tissue class, for example, thick and dure or white matter hyperintensities, this can also be missegmented and 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 drive that or if there are very big uh, differences in contrast of the, of the tissues that can also drive it but if you've checked your data right at the start hopefully you can minimize these these four things that we're particularly not interested in and really sort of game your chances in detecting the the, the things that you're most interested in The idea of nuisance variables, so you want to enter into general linear model, anything that might account for some of the variability in brain uh, structure that you're not interested in. Most typically, this is total intracranial volume, so, so um, you, you want to take that out of the equation before looking at your contrast. And the other common ones where which have quite strong effects on, on overall brain size are age uh, and biological sex, uh, with biological sex often being just a surrogate measure of, of overall size. Um, and so you'll introduce those. If you're doing a multi-site or multi-center study, you may want to also introduce a column um, for each each center that you you use, uh, just to take into account the uh, variation between scanners. So, uh, having when you're doing your your brain analyses, uh, what you're hoping to find is some uh, regional anatomical differences. Um, there is a risk that you may not find anything. You want to try and uh, protect yourself from that before you start any form of analysis. And the way to do this is to come up with a priori regions of interest before you even embark on your study. The way to go about this is you want to do a, a review of the literature or even use some of the MRI meta-analysis based tools to identify areas in the brain where you expect to be finding some changes. Um, doing this in advance and ideally pre-registering this in advance uh, allows you justifiably to accept a slightly lower statistical threshold uh, in those regions alone. And it also allows you to then go and do small volume analyses in those areas to try and just boost your statistical sensitivities. You want to do it in advance because otherwise any uh, decent reviewer will just uh, accuse you of cherry picking. Um, but by pre-registering and you can even pre-register and get a DOI for your regions of interest, then you can clearly show uh, the sequence of events and show that you had this idea and it's all hypothesis driven and it allows and it's this idea that hypothesis testing is slightly uh, stronger than, than just an exploratory analysis 
Now we come to this idea of normalization warping. So, so in order to analyze our data, coming back to what we're trying to do at the start, what we're trying to do is line up like for like regions so we can, we can uh, do this um, uh, statistical contrast. Uh, to do this, we want to calculate the transformation from our individual subject space to a template space. And to do this, we, we calculate these transformations or warps that encodes the regional information about the amount, amount of compression, compression or expansion. Uh, and we, we use those not only for warping our data, but for calculating our, our surrogate measures of volume. So uh, VBM is crucially dependent on the registration performance. The better, the better it uh, the better it does it, the better it works. Um, shoot is, is the preferred method nowadays. You will have heard, you will hear in the past, and it's still in SBM, there's the sort of Dartel toolbox. Um, I would encourage everyone just to lean towards that. And I haven't really touched upon Dartel in this talk at all. Um, and I'll, I'll skip back uh, past this um, because, again, re recommending that everyone nowadays uses the geodesic shooting toolbox. So how does it work? So you'll basically select all your tissue segmentations for your gray matter, your white matter, possibly your CSF as well. Initially, the toolbox will calculate a group average, a sort of initial average from everything. It'll look very fuzzy uh, in terms of the boundaries. And then it will progressively iterate and it will, eat, at each iteration, it will slowly uh, contract and bend and line up all these different structures. So you end up with crisper and crisper templates as you go through uh, the different iterations. What will be written out in your folder will be templates one, two, three, and four. And this basically uh, is an output as it moves through different iterations from one to 24 uh, of, of the, this process with 24 being your, with template four representing your final template that you've calculated. You'll also get a couple of other images. So your deformation field will have the letter Y in front of it. Um, that's what you use for warping you in the deformations toolbox for warping your native data to group average space. The Jacobian determinant uh, file gives you your voxel wise volumetric information. We've already touched upon that. And then there's a, an additional file called the velocity field. Um, these, I think, can go into there's, there's one of the um, sub options nowadays where it allows you to calculate uh, I think it's the scalar momentum and I think it takes that. And this is what it looks like. So this is a shoot group average template from nearly uh, 6,000 people. Um, and hopefully I can convince you that the, the template boundaries are quite crisp. It looks pretty good. And this is the corresponding uh, brain template you have from that. Um, and if you want some point of comparison, you can take some of the older, say, for example, MNI templates, and you'll see that some of these structures are just smoother, less distinct. So it's, 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 it looks very nice. This leads on quite nicely to this idea, well, what template space should I be using? Many of you will have heard of this, the sort of MNI template, you may have heard of Talarac space. In essence, there are lots of examples of template or a group average space. Um, all of them are slightly different. Um, all of these templates basically represents the population from which it was created. And some of these may bias your results. So MNI space, if you actually look at it, it was created from a, a bunch of young Canadian students. Um, and consequently, it's larger than your average template, to be honest. Um, in contrast, if you're dealing with, say, disease groups, so for example, this is a, a group average template from the ADNI data set, and hopefully you can appreciate that actually the, the third ventricle here and the, the ventricles are slightly larger than what we would find in our, in our say, our MNI template. I um, take the approach that the best template to use is the one that really reflects your underlying population and data. So I would encourage everyone to actually create a, a uh, template for each study that they do so that represents the population that you're studying and you'll put all your cohorts into creating one single template yeah um, if you are particularly keen to be reporting or showing your results in mni space for example um, which is useful for meta-analyses then it's really is just a simple transformation from your group average space to whatever you want to report it in um, so that's quite straightforward so this is the sort of coming to the end of the first bit. So to summarize, um, we've gone through all the different steps of a, a sort of basic VBM analysis all the way up to the model design. And there, there are other talks on the general linear model and, and design uh, and creating those. Um, VBM performs voxel wise statistics on smoothed modulated normalized tissue segments. Uh, the SPM itself performs the segmentation and normalization using um, uh, shoot.
the shoot to toolbox improves your spatial normalization for vbm uh, and you can probably use it for your fmri analyses as well if you wanted to um and there'll be more specific details in the demo session um what i may do because it's the this is the online form of the the uh, spm course is i'm going to move straight on I'm going to get through the other two uh, topics that I want to talk about linked to this. And then at the end, I'll answer any questions about any of it. And if as we're going along, you have specific questions, just throw them in the Slack chat or, or say hang on to them and we'll cover them all at the end. So um, what I outlined previously was just a sort of standard cross-sectional VBM design. But many of us are interested in longitudinal analyses. So taking the same subject and asking the question, well, what's changing in the brain over time? Um, lots of interesting things you can do with this from growth, plasticity, aging, degeneration, treatment response in clinical trials. Um, and ha having serial data has some major advantage over just multiple cross-sectional samples. So you, it, it, it sort of increases your power and allows you to uh, try and understand uh, some of the co uh, causal basis of these changes. Um, so what you want to do, so there are some, some um, subtleties when you're doing this. Um, really one of the questions that um, uh, often comes up is, well, where do I align my data to? And if you look at some of the historic studies, people will either align all of their individual scans to the first scan or the last scan. Unfortunately, doing that can introduce a bias. So you, what you'll be doing is progressively interpolating your data more as you move forward or backwards in time. Um, and that can, that can bias your data. You want to try and avoid that um, because it's an as asymmetry in the method. The solution to this is to try and uh, register everything to a midpoint or an individual subject midpoint. So every piece of data has actually been uh, um, treated symmetrically. And in SPM, there is a toolbox called longitudinal registration, which does exactly this. And you can either have just a pair of uh, longwise data, or you can have multiple uh, long, uh, longitudinal data to do this with. And what it essentially does is this, you have you know, your, your individual subject at time point one, two, three, four. And what it will do is we'll um, warp everything to a single subject uh, average midpoint. And once you've got your single subject average midpoint, you can then take the traditional VBM framework and take everything to a group average space. Importantly, when you're at this individual group average midpoint, you can then start calculating gradients of change. So how quickly has the volume changed at each individual voxel. And then when you take that to your group average space, you then have a quantitative map of, of change that you can use for analyses. And that plugs more into the BBQ, the voxel-based quantification side of things. Um, in the uh, longitudinal toolbox, these are some of the things that you will get out uh, when you put your data in. You'll have your average uh, midpoint uh, brain map you'll get some Jacobians and divergences, and then you'll get a, a deformation field to allow you to warp any other data that you're interested in to that midpoint. So you, you can do a sort of two-step um, warping pipeline. So this is an example with the OASIS data set. This is a 66-year-old male with mild cognitive impairment who was scanned over a uh, four, five year, uh, three, four year period. Uh, and hopefully what you can see, so this is our midpoint average, not much change there. Um, and as we go forward in time, you go from the ventricles being small, i.e. dark compared to the midpoint, to much larger. Uh, and actually, if you look uh, carefully, you can see that the, these uh, hippocampal regions, uh, so, so the uh, temporal lobe regions are getting darker compared to our first scan over here. And of course, you can simplify all this data simply by creating, uh, calculating a gradient for each voxel as to how much it's changing. Here's a, a, an average of uh, some of the, the first 82 subjects using exactly the same approach and, and showing a very similar thing. So the difference between controls versus dementia subjects in terms of their longitudinal change. And again, uh, it's always nice having a sanity check with this stuff where you would expect the, the uh, uh, people who are demented to, um, again, have accelerated atrophy in the hippocampal temporal lobe structures. And you can use it for, for all sorts of neat analyses. So this is basically, as I alluded to, fitting a gradient uh, between a whole bunch of um, these Jacobians at the midpoint, showing the difference between the rate of tissue loss in a, a subject with normal aging versus Parkinson's disease. And again, coming back to sanity checks, you, you're finding these areas in the basal ganglia uh, and striatum where you're getting the accelerated tissue loss. 
So this brings brings me on to the, the, the final uh, point with this, this talk. So augmenting VBM and this idea of using quantitative MRI to try and understand or, or boost our understanding of what's driving the underlying uh, tissue changes. So what is quantitative MRI? I've already touched upon how standard T1 weighted uh, MRI is not quantitative. It will vary from scan to scan and you can't analyze the values at each voxel um, because there are lots of things that confound that. In contrast, quantitative MRI are dedicated MRI sequences that have been highly optimized to allow uh, the scanner go, to go from taking pictures of the brain to taking measurements of brain properties, uh, hence the term, term quantitative MRI. In addition to these, you can derive lots of parameter maps that can also be treated as, as quantitative maps, such as cortical thickness, and as we've talked about just a second ago, the longitudinal rate maps, etc. What's the advantage of using quantitative MRI? Well, it allows you to have more precise measures across scanners and centers if you're doing multi-center uh, multi work. Uh, importantly, it gives you greater interpretability at the biophysical level. Um, it, you can, some of the measures will be more sensitive to particular pathological processes. And importantly, we can use our QMRI based uh, base, uh, scans to improve our ability to map brain anatomy just simply because we have a more comprehensive uh, characterization of, of tissue properties. And these are all examples of different types of quantitative MRI. So you have quantitative susceptibility mapping and R2 star. So these sorts of measures are more sensitive to uh, sort of iron weighted um, uh, changes in tissue properties. You've got your uh, R1 or, or 1 over T1 image. So this is a sort of mix between myelin and iron. Uh, magnetization transfer is, is more of a sort of myelin specific uh, measure. Proton density, so the amount of uh, free water. And then you've got more diffusion measures than you can shake a stick at nowadays from the standard ones. So fraction on anisotropy and mean, uh, mean diffusivity through to all the uh, non-Gaussian metrics that are emerging if you, if you acquire multi-shell data. But I've just shown the, the, the noddy outputs, but there are many, many methods um, and everybody has their own favorites. Um, Voxel-based quantification is a way of analyzing all this data within a VBM framework. And it basically is VBM just designed for, just with some minor modifications to allow you to analyze these quantitative uh, measures. And really the only change comes into it uh, right at the end, whereas instead of just creating smooth, smooth warped modulated data, you create these weighted average data. And the reason you create the weighted average data is it allows you to compensate for some of the edge effects you get with the segmentations. You can implement this directly. It's not overly complicated or there's the HMI toolbox, which is a downloadable toolbox for SPM, which will also implement that for you. And then once you've created your uh, warped weighted average quantitative maps, you then use exactly the same SPM framework to analyze your data. So everything else remains the same. And this is an example of where, where it was actually useful. So uh, combining the measures allows us to have, have a, a fresh biophysical insight. This is a previous work we did looking at where in the brainstem, uh, what happens to the brainstem in aging. Um, previous studies had said, well, you know, the, we know that the, the midbrain area here gets, gets smaller and people had this idea that actually, well, it must be down to, the, you know, dopaminergic cell loss and, and cell loss within the substantia nigra. What we showed, so the purple regions show you what you would have got out of a VBM analysis on its own. So we found that there was volumetric change, but it was situated behind the substantia nigra and in the surrounding regions. But ha having access to all of these quantitative measures meant that we could then go and analyze each channel and ask, well, what else is changing? And what we found in the center of these areas of volume loss is that we were also getting falling myelin levels, yeah? So the MT values were going down. And all of a sudden it allows us to understand, well, actually, uh, if you're getting falling myelin levels, or well, maybe this is a tract that's degenerating, and if you see those regions, what you find out is that you're, you've, um, uh, you, you're, you can track out the cerebell cerebellar thalamic tract. And the other thing that we found, and I've not shown, is that in the other measures, we had increasing proton density in this area, so that there's more space between the, 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 the regions. And the interesting thing is that surrounding all of this, you're getting increasing iron deposition. So all of a sudden, you go from simply saying, we've got volumetric change in the midbrain to all of a sudden being able to give a relatively coherent narrative as to the biological basis driving uh, that volumetric change. Right, so 
that's uh, that's the, the end of the talk. So, so to conclude, I've introduced BB, introduced BBM and some of its potential uses. We've talked about tissue segmentation. We've talked a bit about statistics and BBM subtleties, uh, normalization and creating group average templates using the shoot toolbox. We've talked a little bit about the ideas of different templates and to summarize, doesn't really matter, use a population average. And then if you need to move things to MNI for reporting purposes, but you don't have to. I've touched upon the longitudinal toolbox and the, 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 the idea behind quantitative MRI and how you can use quantitative MRI to really sort of furnish your BBM analysis and take it to another level entirely. There's a lot more I could talk about. So in vivo histology, cortical thickness, lesion analysis, uh, structural covariance, uh, machine learning methods, but we'll, we'll stop it there. Um, there is a basic how-to guide um, at this link here. Uh, it still holds true, even though it's written probably about five years ago now, it will take you through all these steps. Probably needs updating a little bit, but um, it, will, it will get you from beginning to end. Um, I'll stop there. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. <laughs>